Just picking right back up where we left off with the last slide. This is a really nice schematic to kind of show you one particular neuron. And so this would be connected to uh, the terminal buttons of this neuron. And then you can see that this would be uh, sending information to this neuron. And then this neuron can then send information to the next one and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, there are lots of connections within neurons themselves. Here we have um, an example of a blown up synapse, and you can kind of see how, and we'll, we'll uh, talk about this in just a few minutes, inside of the axon, and through the axon, all the way down to the axon terminals, we can see these microtubules, and these will transmit um, uh, the uh, chemicals down to the, to the uh, terminal bouton, and that these are these vesicles containing the neurotransmitters will then um, go into be released. So they essentially open, um, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about transmission of information uh, into the synaptic cleft, and then will bind to the receptor if it's the right molecular shape. Um, so see, the chemical is like the key and the receptor as the lock, and it has to fit together. Um, here, uh, so this is kind of a blown up uh, connection point. And then here you can see the, so these are the dendrites. This is the uh, axon hillock here. These are the, this is the axon going all the way down, which is being wrapped by uh, a fatty substance called a myelin sheath. And again, we're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, each point here that is not wrapped in the myelin sheath is the node of Ranfier. Um, here we can see a blown up version of this, and we can see how the fatty material kind of wraps around that. And then you can actually see the microtubule going through, which is this is the end of the microtubule here. And then inside the cell body here, you can see that this is all the, all the machinery that is in the cell, all the important parts. And we're going to go through each of these um, sort of individually. So looking at the internal structure of the cell, this is the cell body, right? And so the cell body has these dendrites, and then here there are some spines here that are located um, on the dendrites. And we can see that the there is a, a, a structure here, right? So this is the uh, portion of the membrane that's going to separate it from the extracellular fluid. Now the extracellular fluid, um, which, you know, is cerebral spinal fluid, um, CSF, um, this is a very salty fluid. It's, it's got a high concentration of sodium ions in it, and we'll talk about that later, but just to kind of, kind of put in your head that the extracellular fluid, which is what the neuron is surrounded by, to, is, is a, is a salt, salt, saltatory um, uh, fluid. And then the intracellular fluid, so there's fluid inside of the cell, okay, and that's separated by the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane also regulates what comes in and out of the cell, and so most things can't get into the cell, um, and so what can get in is regulated by proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane, and we're going to uh, talk about those uh, in just a minute. So when it comes to the cell membrane, okay, it's made up of phospholipids. And so some of them are hydrophilic um, and some of them are hydrophobic. And so the idea is, is that we don't want anything coming in. We want these um, fluids, the extracellular fluid to stay on the outside. And we, so here we want the intracellular fluids to stay on the inside. Inside, so the phosphate groups that bind to uh, the phosphate groups will bind to water, and so because these are hydrophilic, right? Um, they're phosphorus, and then the fatty acid tails here, okay, these are hydrophobic, um, they don't bind to water because they're made up of fats or lipids, and so that allows for the uh, membrane to be constructed in a way to uh, keep keep the extracellular fluid out and keep the intracellular fluid in. Now, there are some proteins uh, that are um, on the cell membrane that 
whose job it is, is to allow certain things to come in and out of the cell. And these certain things are ions, okay? So we have um, three major structures that allow for passage of ions. So the first one is a channel, and this is just an opening, okay? So here, this is potassium. So K positive is a, it's a positive ion. Um, that is, uh, or a cation, right? Um, that is uh, an example of one of the, the ions that can be allowed in this particular channel. So a channel is just an opening and it allows ions to come in. A gate is actually has the ability to open and to close. And the gate is a protein that only allows things to come in. For example, this case is sodium, so it's, in a, it's a positive ion. Okay. It will only allow certain um, ions to come in when it's open and then when it's closed, this is this gate is not allowing anything in. Okay, And then finally we have a pump, which is a more complex version of a gate. And what this does is it transports substances across the membrane. So here is an example of allowing sodium in while rotating potassium out. Okay, so it's essentially pumping one ion, you know, and, it, and there's a ratio and we'll talk about that later. It allows for pumping certain ions in and pumping others out. And this helps to regulate um, the uh, electrical voltage of the cell. And we'll talk more about that process when we talk about action potentials and the transmission of chemical information and electrical information, because that's important to regulate the um, voltage of the cell. Now, when we look at the internal structures of uh, a cell, and many of you probably are very familiar with the cell body and internal structures of a, of a typical cell. So the cell is a factory for producing proteins, right? Um, and all of its organelles allow it to be able to do that. And so um, the, the portion of the, the cell body that is the, um, the nucleus Oh, hold on one second. We're going to get, I have an, a separate slide for that. I'm going to, I'm not going to jump too far ahead, but the nucleus, okay, which is located here. This is important. Oh, I actually do have it on here. Sorry. Um, but I have another slide for it as well. Um, this is going to contain instructions for the cell. This is going to tell the cell what it needs to do. Um, and, uh, it also uh, tells it when it's going to live and die. And then we have mitochondria, which helps to produce energy. And then we have the ribosomes, which is the, um, that's going to allow the genetic constructions to get processed into proteins and serve the function of the cell. And then here, if we look specifically at the nucleus here, um, this is the, what we refer to as the executive office. DNA resides there. It's the full instructions on what that cell needs to do with its life. It contains gene transcription and allows for that information to um, uh, govern the cell. If we look here, we have these um, endoplasmic reticulum and they contain ribosomes and the ribosomes are going to um, uh, serve as a catalyst to synthesize proteins. And that is very important for the transmission of information as we go down the line. Now, if you guys remember from the very beginning of, of the lecture before the videos, we talked about Golgi. Um, and Golgi discovered uh, Golgi uh, apparatus, and we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Um, but Golgi bodies here, okay, these are the um, uh, package proteins that are in vesicles, and that tells essentially um, the proteins, the, the, the vesicles, where to go, okay? Um, and then the vesicles will then travel down the microtubules, and these microtubules transport those vesicles. So remember, a vesicle is like a little like bubble, and it's filled with chemicals, and that gets transported through the axon all the way down to the microtubule. Um, and so in the case of transporting chemicals and proteins outside of the um, 
the cell, uh, that's where the microtubules will go. And if there needs to be transportation within the cell, the microtubules will also do that as well. Um, so their job is basically the microtubules are these little tubes that transport those chemicals throughout, depending on where they're needed, and the instructions given by the Golgi bodies of where to go. So here we have the Golgi bodies. Um, we have uh, um, all of the structures that we talked about here. This is just a bigger labeling. We have the nucleus. Um, we have the tubules, microtubules here, the axon right here. Um, and so all of these structures are going to help keep the cell alive. It's going to help uh, make sure that the uh, cell understands what it needs to do and what it needs, how long it lives and all of the information that it needs to continue doing its job. So looking at the uh, way that proteins are transported, you can see that, so here we have the Golgi bodies. This is where it's gonna essentially get its directions on where to go. Um, here is where the vesicles are sort of made, the uh, vesicles contain those chemicals um, transported then down the axon. So here you can see it's going to be moved along. Uh, and so if we had one here, it's gonna actually be moved along and, and walked down the microtubule and then there are lots of different, uh, essentially, uh, there's a lot of different processes after the point of it of it getting to the the microtubule, uh, the, getting to the terminal but bouton. Um, so it can um, be incorporated into the membrane. It can stay in the terminal bouton and act as an enzyme, and it might, um, for example, process up any of the um, chemicals that get sort of left in the synaptic cleft. Um, it can be excreted through exotysos uh, exotysosis through the, uh, the, the membrane onto the receiving cell. Um, and it just depends on what instructions um, it was given and, and what the actual chemical um, is um, or protein is. Now we've talked about glial cells. Um, and so when we originally were talking about the difference between neurons and glial cells. Now remember glial comes from the word glue and we have a lot more glial cells because they're kind of like all of the in-between. Um, and so the purpose of the glial cells is to help keep the neurons alive, um, whether it is for immune function or to provide it energy, um, whatever it might be. We have five main types um, of uh, glial cells. So we have ependymal cells, we have astrocytes, microglial cells, um, oligodendrical cells, and Schwann cells. These right here make up the myelin sheath. Okay, so these are, ooh, I can't spell. Ooh, I still can't spell. <laughs> I've spelled that wrong. Oh my goodness. Um, we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to the, the, the Schwann and the oligodendrocyte cells. Um, I cannot believe, there we go. Let's throw that E in there. Um, so this is about 50% of, of brain volume. We have 10 times more glial cells than we do neurons because they uh, serve the purpose of keeping the neurons alive. Okay. Um, so let's kind of look at each of these individually. So let's start with the ependymal cells. So these are small, they're ovid, they're found in the walls of the ventricles. They help to um, provide us with the um, cerebral spinal fluid. They make and secrete that cerebral spinal fluid to allow for those neurons to have that extracellular fluid. Um, and so these are very important for um, that process. Um, when we look at astrocytes, for example, these are star-shaped. Here's an example of an astrocyte. Um, here, they're, uh, they're very symmetrical. They uh, uh, serve as sort of a structural component. Um, and here you can see how they sort of wrap themselves around 
um, different neurons. They're important for transporting substances because they help to, if you can see here that there's some gaps here. So some of these are really, really tight junctions to allow nothing through. Um, and then, and then in some cases they're allowing some molecules through what we refer to as the blood brain barrier, because this uh, is um, a very, very complex uh, capillary network. And so the idea is, is that the blood brain barrier serves as a way to prevent any kind of toxic substances to get into the brain. Um, and so interestingly, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, um, the bigger molecules uh, can't actually get into the, they can't cross the blood brain barrier. So like if you were to give somebody a pill that had dopamine, um, that is actually too big of a molecule to get into these, uh, th into the, the actual um, capillaries, um, into the blood system. Um, and so what do we do? Because we can't give people dopamine, we actually give them the pre cursor to dopamine, which is L-DOPA, and then we sort of trick the brain into making more of it. Um, and so that's kind of how we get around the blood-brain barrier issue um, of uh, trying to get um, treatment, for example, for, for people. Now, another thing that the glial cells and astrocytes specifically do is form scar tissue. Um, and we'll talk more about the formation of scar tissue and why that can be good and bad for the brain later, um, but essentially the astrocytes job is to do that. So they're wrapping around these cells um, and creating kind of kind of gluing them together um, to the capillaries um, to allow for, for um, um, some in substances to come uh, in and out of the neurons and the capillaries. Now, um, <clears throat> another thing that um, is really important for um, this, this transport is to be able to um, receive uh, information and to know what um, what those neurons need in terms of energy. And so um, they sort of modulate the activity to say, okay, well, you know, these neurons have been working really hard and they need more energy to sustain them. Um, they also really important for detecting that neural activity and regulating um, the uh, adjacent capillaries that they're wrapped around to uh, sort of uh, monitor blood flow. So here you can actually see uh, here the um, the astrocytes surrounding and um, insulating synapses, um, and these are really important for modifying synaptic activity. So um, this is actually a really interesting kind of uh, way to be able to modulate activity, um, but it's actually uh, uh, wrapping itself completely around these synapses to insulate them and make sure that um, they are, you know, they're, they're actually directly uh, modifying that activity. Microglia, um, these are um, a sort of an offshoot of the immune system, and they do things like phagocytosis, uh, phagocytosis, uh, phagocytosis, which is essentially um, removing any kind of debris, scavenging out any kind of uh, sick or damaged cells, anything that needs to be sort of removed. And they also um, identify and they attack foreign tissue. Um, if a brain cell is damaged, they invade the area. They provide growth factors that help aid repair to allow for that um, cell to essentially not die. Um, they also do things like prune synapses. Um, so during development, um, if you are not using particular synapses, the microglia's job is to take out anything that's sort of not being used to clean it up. And so it will actually prune out um, those synapses. And so we actually do have, and we'll talk more about this in development stages where we see more um, excessive pruning occur in the brain where those synapses sort of get um, trimmed out. Think of it like pruning a bush. Um, and those, uh, those uh, uh, um, microglia are essentially the cleanup crew to make sure that we have healthy cells and we don't sort of gum up that area with um, extra proteins. 
So the last kind of um, glial cells we're going to talk about are the two cells that make up myelin. So if we look at, so here we have um, oligodendrocytes and we have Schwann cells. So their jobs is to wrap around the axon, squeeze out that cytoplasm in the glial cells, and to insulate those axons to allow for better electrical impulse. Um, and so we're going to talk about a condition called multiple sclerosis where we see the um, where we see these these fatty myelin sheath start to degrade and that causes problems in the in the um, uh, transmission of electrical information throughout the axon of the cell. So because you can actually see uh, the layers of how these cells are wrapped around, Okay, you see how they're, they're, they're just multiple layers. These are lipid bilayers made up of fatty substance or lipids um, that, that are going to insulate those cells. And we're going to talk about the two kinds of glial cells here. So uh, uh, oligodendrocytes, these are in the central nervous system. So these are found in the brain and the spinal cord. And here you can see that one oligodendrocyte um, or oligodendrocyte is going to wrap itself around multiple axons. So here you can see, um, and you can see here all the different layers of it wrapping around the different, uh, the the, the um, multiple axons, so cross axons. And you're gonna see that the Schwann cells look a little bit different. So the difference between um, um, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells is that the oligodendrocytes are found in the brain and spinal cord, but the Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system. And so here you can see, so this would be like um, looking at sort of like a motor neuron here, okay? So here's the axon, and it goes throughout the whole thing. And then this is like a side view. So if you kind of cut this view, and so this is the axon here, it actually will wrap itself, oh, I'm going the wrong way, around the segment of the axon, okay? So each cell is myelinate, myelinate one segment of the axon versus spreading itself over other axons like an oligodendrocyte. These are looking at sort of segments of um, each uh, each segment of each um, axon. And so what this does is allows for the electrical signal to propagate or jump from node to node. So each of these is called a node of Ranvier, and they do not contain the insulated material, okay? Um, and so here you can see that uh, this insulating material is really important to allow for very quick and efficient propagation of that electrical pulse. If you were to have some kind of disease or a problem where the um, myelin sheath is damaged, okay, what happens is, is it can't jump anymore and it has to propagate the entire length of this and so it's just so slow it's just do 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 going little bits at a time okay versus being able to jump and jump here it can jump and it can jump and so it's much faster much more rapid and because it's a slower signal and in some cases um it can't continue okay if it's damaged um this would uh essentially uh uh mess up all of these signals going from uh, electrical signal from cell to cell. And so in the case of multiple sclerosis or MS, we see it's an autoimmune condition where these uh, myelin sheath are essentially being attacked by your own body and it's, and it's sort of degrading their, um, the, the layers. And so what happens is, is depending on where you see this whole thing occur is where you're going to see symptoms. So if you see the myelin sheath uh, degrading in the visual system, okay, so if you see uh, anywhere along the sort of primary visual cortex, um, then that person's going to experience symptoms with vision. So they might experience um, uh, blind spots. They might not be had. They might have blurry vision. They might not be able to see things very well. If you see this happening in a motor neuron, let's say in the area that controls um, 
like your legs and your walking, your balance, then you're going to see that person have a lot of problems with balance and a lot of problems with being able to um, uh, walk. They might uh, be very weak. Their, their limbs might be very weak. So depending on where you see this happening in the brain and which neurons are sort of attacked, that's where you're going to see the um the symptoms so everybody that has ms tends to have a uh, sort of a different set of symptoms um depending on the pattern of damage within the brain um and of course there's overlap so people who have uh, uh you know degrading myelin in the motor area are going to have similar symptoms if they all have it in the same area um and and you know but what you typically see is a person might experience a sort of unique set of symptoms um, now, one really interesting thing is that we have found that glial cells aren't just passive insulators. They do play an active role in modulating neural activity, but we still don't really know exactly what that modulation activity, uh, all what it does and why. Um, so that's still an area that we're learning uh, a lot about. Now, another thing that we see, of course, if there's uh, injury to the nervous system, if there's injury to those glial cells, we're going to see loss of sensation, we're going to see loss of movement. In the case of um, uh, multiple sclerosis, you're going to see, in some cases, paralysis, because uh, depending on where uh, the damage is, um, and just generally speaking, so not even MS, but just damage to um, the nervous system and, and, and um, damage to uh, specific cells. You might see somebody have uh, a partial paralysis or weakness. We call it, um, so like hemiparesis, for example. Um, we're going to see uh, that depending on where the damage is associated with. Now, um, in the central nervous system, we don't necessarily see repair. We're going to see um, uh, depending on the situation and how extensive the damage is, we may not see repair. We may not see regrowth. Um, sometimes we do see that functions get sort of redistributed to other areas. So like if you have an, an injury um, that's going to affect how you can use your arm, for example, we might see a little redistribution, which is that neuroplasticity happening. Um, but in some cases that that repair doesn't take place. And in some cases, um, the regrowth is inhibited by other factors and, and does not happen. Um, and in, in cases, of course, of extreme paralysis, we see uh, that there is no recovery um, in some cases. Now, the peripheral uh, nervous system, we do see those microglia. We see the Schwann cells that, that, that attempt to help repair neurons. But depending on the extensiveness of the damage, it just depends on what... Uh, what is damaged and how extensive that damage is. So just kind of looking at what happens here. Um, so when if we were to cut um, a peripheral axon, for example, um, this right here is going to die off. Okay. Um, now it doesn't mean that this cell is going to necessarily die. Um, what can happen is is that it'll sort of sprout out um, here and then. Um, we'll see that the uh, Schwann cells will divide and then um, attempt to form new myelin. And this right here sort of grows out, right, um, into a, a, a longer axon. And those dividing Schwann cells will then work to then surround these segments of neuron here, or axon, excuse me, here. And you can see here that they'll go in this direction to then form those layers. So looking here, peripheral neuron axon dies. Okay, it's cut and dies. And then those Schwann cells are going to shrink and then divide. And it's going to attempt to um, uh, uh, form along what used to be the axon. The axon will then sprout going to move its way out. It's going to sprout out here and then it's going to, these dividing Schwann cells will then wrap themselves around those segments. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and I'm going to uh, pick up lecture next time. And um, if you have any questions, you can email me and let me know. Um, and uh, I will have assumed that you watch the videos before our next class because um, I will just pick right back up um, where we leave off into gross neurons.